Welcome to a video series on Make Capitalism History, a book that was launched 2023 that Stefan Merenz and me, Simon Sutterlütti, wrote um, 2018 and which was now translated to English. We're really excited. Um, and this first video is just a short introduction. And it will be about why a market economy can't be reformed in a social ecological way, how a post-wage society that we call communism beyond market economy and socialist command economy may look like, who collects the garbage down and how to do a domination free planning, and how the seed form commons and social movements together could overcome capitalism. Um, and there are other videos that go into more depth. Who collects the garbage? How does coordination look like? Why state socialism didn't work? And how do we get into a different society? Okay. So materially, it's clear what needs to be done on a social or ecological level. So why don't we do it? What do we lack? Willingness or political power? I think basically we lack the possibility. Capitalism makes a social and ecologic transformation so impossible in its own terms, so expensive that it can neither be wanted nor implemented. We need an alternative. And this means for us not an alternative only to market economy, but also to state socialism. <clears throat> Bini Adamczak wrote beautifully, Under the conditions of crisis, there is no mere defense of status quo. That is why the world cannot be safe without a plan to change it. That is why utopia is needed. And then if we think about utopias or alternatives to capitalism, usually three come to mind. The first one isn't really a different, but it's um, an eco-social market economy. And these people that fight for this, they will attribute capitalism a lot to neoliberalism and they want to get rid of neoliberalism and put a lot of eco and social boundaries into place for the market economy. But basically it's still a market economy. Um, some people will fight for the command economy, put two points here, like if the state socialism that we've seen with in the 20th century, but with more democratization and all this kind of stuff. And they are against the market. They want to get rid of the market and private property. So they're closer to our approach, but still different because <clears throat> there's not this needs-based distribution and still this, still this compulsion to work. And the third approach would be this post-wage society, um, where it's against market, private property and the obligation to work. And there's this needs-based distribution of work and goods that it's not according to your performance, money, power, whatever, but according to your needs, how you get things. So <clears throat> to think about the eco-social market economy. So now the limits to radical reformism. If you think about the market economy, um, usually there's a market which we can think of generalized exchange. You will have market and exchange in a lot of other societies, but in 18th, 19th century Europe, um, these markets become gen this exchange becomes generalized and very important within the whole society. And this leads to competition. This competition creates efficiency that's based on a profit efficiency. It will become efficient in producing new goods or making things cheaper. But basically, it's also a competition that creates this logic of exclusion, exploiting nature, exploiting workers, um, and also producing things in a way that not the use value is in the center, but the exchange value, how you can sell it. Um, and basically, this competition also leads to capital, this compulsion to valorize that like um, big companies at Nestle, they don't go for, go for more profit because they want to, but because they have to. If they don't have um, the highest profit, they have less money to, for new innovation, new products, new market, and that's why they will lose finally. People that are for radical reformism will say no problem, we have to state around there. And the state was always very important to kind of um, shield the market from itself. But we would always argue that finally it's, the state isn't like the superstructure, but capitalism is the superstructure. Um, and the state is only part of it. it, only ha it the, the state has the autonomy because it gathers its money from taxes and not from selling stuff. But um, finally, it's dependent on a uh, flourishing economy and therefore dependent on flourishing profit and competition and all these things that we finally want to get rid of. Um, and this also hinders the state. You can see it with carbon taxes. First, the carbon taxes are usually not that high, but even in um, countries like Sweden, where they are pretty high, um, the effects on the, on the emissions are minimal. And it's like 
if you look at the, these um, political studies that try to see how much um, changes there, they're kind of disturbing. So there's really the question reformism or an alternative reproductive system. And for us, it's not only beyond the eco-social market economy, but also beyond the command economy 2.0, because between the market economy and the democratic command socialism, there's kind of only this range where you have Green New Deal, eco-social market economy, market socialism, um, or the capitalist command economy where the means of production are still private. But these are all um, linked together by wage labor money and commodity production. You can see this way here to go into more detail about the democratic command socialism. So we talk about communism, a, a different society, a post-wage society, and it's kind of just a concretization there. There are different models out there and maybe ours will help to think about things. Utopia is always something that you have to get together from different viewpoints, from different privileges, global north, global south, um, and that's like only our part there. So communism for us, it's a so society where there's the logic of inclusion in the center. So a society of exclusion is a society where have good reasons to live at the expense of others. That's what I do every day and everybody in capitalism does it because it just makes sense um, to compete for workplace or to buy cheaper products and therefore um, destroying living conditions. It just makes sense and even yeah, fair trade and ecological um, biological buying you also know that it doesn't really work in the end because the logic of exclusion is also for this company out there. So we need a society of inclusion where we have good reasons to include others. It's not about being a good person but to make it suggested, to make it reasonable to include others. And that would be a society beyond altruism and egoism. And for these conditions of inclusion we think of two. There's voluntariness, that people choose what they want to do and can't be forced to by credits or money or whatever, um, because this, of course, is no <laughs> um, condition of inclusion if I can force people to work via money. And collective disposal, which means on the one hand of the means of production are collectivized, not only the, the workers that use these means, um, but also the people that they work with, they are dependent on. Um, also collective disposal means on the consumption or distribution side that a lot of things like food or healthcare and basic healthcare and clothing will be like for free withdrawal because the side, because we um, decided that we need that much of it and so it's just free to take. And some things um, they are scarce where we have to have some kind of rationing systems, maybe a lottery or maybe discussions or whatever it should be. Some people think of credits. And of course, and then there's the question out there, who collects the garbage? There are different ways to deal with it. We can automate, we can reorganize work that it's like, um, in a way organized that it's more need-based and not that <laughs> exploit exploitation-based as in this society. Then we may divide it and rotate it. There's also sufficiency that we don't have to build, um, go for everything. And some things we just can get rid of or don't do. That's also important. Um, possibility and there may be social norms like some people say it's very important to have a social norm that I don't only want to live in a commune where we agree to work for four hours a day whatever um, we're critical about these social norms but it's important to a lot of people so the next question is how do we coordinate such a society and usually there's the decentral more anarchist idea where you have all these communes producing for themselves a lot of stuff and then combine um, cooperating at certain things when they build in energy infrastructure or complex products um, and there's this problem that it's maybe too much particularity and um, cooperation may be difficult to achieve at some points. On the other hand, you have centrality, where you have like a, a state-like institution. A lot of these things are council-based that tell reproduction systems and infrastructure what to do. Um, and there, there you might create new hierarchies. So we vote for a polycentral organization where many places decide independently. Um, and there are social meta commons that help with planning and conflicts. There are material meta commons, a kind of infrastructure that create like the infrastructure for water, energy, and all this kind of stuff, and the concrete um, commons that do the reproduction part. Um, and the decisions are in a polycentral network 
made in many places. The inclusion is via use value orientation because of course, these, if I'm a worker in these commons, I only produce because I want to create use values because I'm not paid for it. I only do what I think makes sense. And they are dependent on others. So if we cooperate with somebody who uses an ecologically damaging production method, then we'll say, what? Why are you doing this? How can we help you to change it? And if they don't change it, maybe we'll look for other partners. Our exclusive behavior will be damaging for the cooperation. There will also be commons clusters with collective planning and aggregation as long as it's inclusive, for example, if we build solar plants. But um, to go in more detail in this video about coordination. So, transvolution um, is our term where we combine like transformation and revolution. You can still call it transformation or revolution however you want it. We just went to like kind of get a new term for it because it's so difficult. Um, and there are three different things how to think about um, transformation usually. There's reform. It's the politics of the small step, climbing a mountain. It's a lot about continuity you know, within the institution. The state there is the tool and it still usually stays within the market economic structure. There's this concept of revolution, the politics of the great leap um, with a sudden break. And there's like the state socialist revolution where it's about staking, taking the state power and um, taking over the state power. And then with a post-revolutionary planning state rebuilding society and more the anarchist revolution where there's the destruction of the state is important and the revolutionary self-organization um, is um, pretty important. And this is also linked to the third idea, the anarchist revolution, to the construction, where it's a lot of the politics of the practice where we are building alternatives and we want to strengthen this third part in particular. We, we use a theory for this that we call seed form theory. I explain it why it, um, um, the change, the transformation from feudalism to capitalism. So first you will have exchange in markets in a lot of societies, also in the feudal society, um, but it's only part of the society, only at certain places where this exchange really works. There's a lot of subsistence base too. Um, and these markets, they're functional to the feudalism and to the feudal elite especially, but incompatible because then you will have all these struggles between the merchant class and the nobility. And within the only modern time, 1500 to 1800, the seed form of exchange and markets will grow bigger, like just in quantity, and also change their quality. Like the competition will become very important there. First, it was the competition was hindered by um, privileges, monopolies, and all that kind of stuff. So in the 18th and 19th century, the seed form theory becomes the dominant form of reproduction, there's this change of domination and the markets dominate the societal coordination and then you have the restructuring of the whole society with industrialization, politarization, commodification and everything. Our seed farm, we think of our commons and commons are beyond market and the state, they're usually referred to and we think they're very much based on this voluntariness and collective disposal. For collective disposal you may say in the traditional commons, there is a part of the land that the village is using. Um, it's used as a commons, common pasture, where they give themselves roofs, how many sheep can go there, whatever. But um, you also see commons in hunter-gatherer societies, where voluntariness is very important in collective disposals. And in some of them, the, in the egalitarian ones, more or less all the things that are produced are commons and are used as commons, means of production and the things to consume. And it's a, um, and it's a lot of a need-based distribution mechanism and not a performance or um, power-based. So with Wikipedia, voluntariness is very important to create all these articles and all this knowledge. And then it's collectively disposed of. The, the knowledge is like free to everybody because knowledge can be basically free. But you also see it in a lot of social movements. Here we have a climate camp where voluntariness is very important to create all the structure and collective disposal against like racist structure, sexist structure, where we have like a democratic, safe, organized um, common structure in the center of these movements. The change of domination, where this um, seed forms become um, societally dominant, you can think of it as becoming functional to capitalism, and some of these commons are, but a lot of them are not. <laughs> there may be state support with commons public partnerships. There may be a slow expansion. In commons you have this idea a lot of a slow expansion. And, and the fourth um, scenario would be a commons movement, social movements that like push commons forward and these commons are also helping social movements to become bigger and that's like the scenario that we think 
may make a lot of sense. So thanks for listening and um, enjoy all the other videos and the book. See you.